Namaste, Alicia. Thank you so much for being part of our Himsa conversations and welcome. Thank you. How do you do? Good morning. I am Good very afternoon well. For you. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Thank you. So, Alicia, what is? Let's start with your childhood. I mean, what is your earliest recollection of either the concept or the experience of uh, nonviolence? Oh well. Um, my first experiences on nonviolence in the field of conceptualization and then in the field of practices, let's see. In the field of conceptualization is when I started being uh, very, how can I say, worried about what was happening in my country, my born country that it is Argentina in Latin America, where I see in the streets, so many poor people. I was on that time a middle class young girl that uh, is related to political issues, social issues because of the conversation in my house and my home and with my parents that they are sensitive on this. But really for me, it was very hard to see that uh, poverty and poverty and misery around me when I go to neighborhoods where I work with a group of teenagers. So I think that that was violent and that was violent with, uh, with the peoples and with the way that they live. And so I started thinking, what can I do? So that in order to change that violent in a way way of living in a better situation. So I started thinking, what kind of work can I do to that structural violence that surrounded me? And that was my first uh, thinking and I was 18 years old. Eh? So it was a long time ago, I have to tell you. Uh, and then I started to study, I decided to study history, Latin American history particularly. It was my specialization at that time in the university because I studied the university. And then I thought that perhaps studying history, I shall have, I should have answers to this question. Why are such kind of uh, social and economical differences in the world that create violence in the world, that create wars in the world, that creates uh, non-comfortable relationships between different people. So my decision was to study a field related in order to answer that question. That was my first steps, dear colleague. And I think this is what led you then to enter peace studies. Exactly. First, I studied history. There were no peace studies in Latin America as such. Eh? As such. I am talking about the 80s. And so there, there doesn't exist, uh, particularly because peace studies have not entered in the country with that name. And also, you have to remember, because in the 70s and 80s, we have dictatorships in all the continent, from Central America to South America. So it, is, it was absolutely forbidden to talk and to study issues related to uh, economical issues, sociology issues, um, violence, nonviolence, human rights, and peace. So all these fields are considered forbidden, are considered dangerous by the dictatorships in all the countries. I have to remind you and uh, the people that is here in this, this video that uh, all the countries in the south of Latin America are covered what we called the wave of dictatorships. So all at the same time that at the same time make a kind of alliance between them. So it was very difficult to study that. So you have to study another field in order to very slowly 
going to peace studies. So my first approach to peace studies was really in the end of the 80s, when the dictatorships ended in the continent at the same time, more or less, in between 83, 84, 85, 19, no? the last century, and then started the human rights studies, and then in the 90s, peace studies, but not before, not before than the 90s. You've also worked a great deal in education. And I was wondering in what ways education and peace studies have gone together for you. And if in this journey, Gandhian nonviolence has been an influence or has been uh, a factor at all, or any other school, uh, what are the other schools that may have influenced you? Yeah, of course, all of us know Gandhi school. I mean, it was a kind of uh, lighthouse for us to read that was uh, that was allowed. Uh, Gandhi was allowed because uh, the the dictatorship thing that that was a philosopher and it was in India and so it is very very far and so it doesn't matter if we read or not which means that they know nothing about Gandhi as you can imagine. So we think that Gandhi was a lighthouse himself, by the way, and also a master and a teacher for us uh, for thinking about uh, uh, violent conditions, for thinking about democracy, for thinking about uh, critical thinking and understanding. So we were influenced by Gandhi and Gandhi, uh, we have not books in Spanish, so those who speak English or understand English, we read directly in English. So besides it was forbidden, this is an important point that you have to know, um, uh, some authors, this author was considered innocent in a way, which was not at all, but, and we understand that, but not a military government as very many other things. So that makes us an, a path, a narrow path to enter in Gandhian ideas. So we read it. Uh, the other school that influenced us, of course, was the school of Oslo by Galtung. So we read also uh, Galtung theories on violence, structural, adept, and cultural violence, and also about conflict and positive conflict, and uh, the first studies on peace. So that was uh, related to the conceptual framework. Uh, the other issue was uh, the education, uh, the education trip in a way. Uh, studying uh, social sciences and history of Latin America, as I told you, I realized that that uh, didn't satisfy me. I mean, I was not satisfied only by learning about concepts and events. I want to learn how to teach them. So I started to be a kind of expert in how to teach history and social sciences. Uh, and so uh, I go to the pedagogy studies. So after the history studies, I study pedagogy and education in order to know and to start uh, practicing how to teach what I know. <laughs> that was quite difficult, by the way. And on that field and on that road, I started to be um, a kind of teacher in human rights, how to teach human rights and democracy in Latin America. And very quickly, um, I was pointed by the UNESCO because of my English, I suppose, and I know in other languages. So uh, they are trying to find Latin American professors or teachers that are experts in education 
experts or trying to be experts, I have to say you that I was not on that time, on human rights and democracy, because they are that Latin American um, fields are very interested for the UNESCO and also for Africa that was making a process like us that then stopped, by the way. So I started to work uh, for the UNESCO. Uh, I am uh, Italian as well, so I am a Latin American and Italian that uh, allows me to enter to the European um, readings and uh, alliances and groups that are a, that are experts in this field. So there, there, that was the point that you're asking me. So I, I show him the analysis of the reality from a historical point of view, the analysis of violence and non-violence, the analysis of building peace with the teaching. So how I can make this uh, knowledge for uh, teachers and educators um, forming eh, in the teachers training and professors training that it is more or less my expertise today. Uh, and I am very, very fond of that, that specific field. Was this the same process, the work with the UNESCO? Is that how you came to be connected with the civil statement on violence? Because you have, I think, worked perhaps with Professor Adams. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, yes. Um, Professor David Adams uh, was near me from very early time, I would say from the end of the 80s, because I was very interested. And today it is a, a reading that it is a must for my students in all the countries. I was very impressed by the civil statement of 1986 that uh, David Adams was the, co the conveyor of that statement. And uh, that statement, as you may know, was also related directly to the, um, the United Nations resolution number 53 of October 1999, that uh, they recommended uh, peace education and culture of peace education as a must in all the ministries of education of the world. So there is a relationship in between the civil statement and it's the coordinator of that group that uh, wrote and uh, exchanged ideas for the civil statement, David Adams, and, the, um, and also the work of Federico Mayor Zaragoza as general secretary of the UNESCO with the uh, United Nations resolution that was so important because it really, uh, I would say, stayed a kind of before and an after in culture of peace education. So I have a very good relation with David till now. We are very good friends and work and work together. Even now, last week, uh, he is retired now, but he's not <laughs> in a way. Yeah, you know, and that it's a, a kind of uh, kind of characteristic of peace educators and in peace studies, you know, that we never retired. So he's very active as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You know, many years ago, I think almost 20 years ago, you wrote an essay for the International Peace Research Institute. Uh, it was a study you did called, What is the Meaning of Violent Toys? So, and I, I have a feeling that that is a theme that would have stayed with you. So can you share some of your insights on the phenomenon of violent toys and what they are doing to societies across the world? Yeah, on that time, uh, we observe that uh, violent toys are one of the most popular toys in our shops. So, and uh, it is usual, not now, but it was what well, I expect, not now, by the way. Well, but uh, it was usual that you give us a present to children, particularly the boys, by the way, um, uh, weapons. So it is uh, usual to see big guns, plastic big guns that are in the, in the shop windows, 
in Christmas, and there is in Latin America another very big important uh, fiesta, it's an event uh, that you in the north don't have, and in the east that it is Reyes Magos, Mashi Queens, Mashi Queens, that it is January the 6th, that it is a very, very important event for the children in the in all Latin America and Spain. It comes from Spain. That is the three kings that came to to bless the the Jesus Christ. The three kings come with presents to the baby on January the sixth, after six days of the born of the Jesus Christ. It's important for the children in all the Spanish world. And so the parents give presents on January the 6th, uh, remembering that. And it is in some countries, it's more important than Christmas. You have to remember this. And it is particularly for children. And so they are expecting not clothes, not books, but toys. And so that, that, that date, January the 6th is for toys. And so we see that there are violent toys, war toys everywhere, everywhere in the continent, everywhere in Spain. So we decided to analyze this. We made a project that it was uh, uh, peace and not war toys. And so we made a very, very important campaign that have a prize for the UNESCO because First, we made a campaign on non-violence and non-violent toys for the children, but then we go to the adults in order to tell them not to buy that toys. And then we go to the um, factories of toys. So we try to push the, the toy factories not to produce war toys. It was a very important campaign, uh, very well well done, by the way, during months, that we create a really conscious uh, about not buying, not producing, not buying, and not giving war toys. You know that today, I, I, of course not because of that campaign, but today this is even bad seen from my point of view. I mean, if you are in a shop and you see a parent buying a big gun, you're going to look like this. I mean, it's not well seen in the society, at least in our countries now and also in Spain. So that campaign was a kind also very important event in that we have a prize for the research, Peace Research Institute on that time, and we continue doing that. So we are very proud of that. This is because there is ample research to show that there is a connection between children playing with guns and their attitude to violence when they are grown ups. Am I correct? You are correct, but it is also an attitude of the parents because the parents and the grandparents were the people that buy that. So we started with the children, but immediately we realized that we have to go to the adults. So it is seen like a children campaign, but the speech comes more and more to the adults in order to make them realize what they are doing. And also we connect this with the international organization, the International Peace Bureau, that they have a very uh, uh, important campaign on disarmament. So we try to connect the idea of disarmament with the idea of the war toys and said that we don't want to prepare the children for war. We don't want to, to think that, the, that the, to make the, the children and the parents think that the only solution for violence is war or violent, while violent weapons. The solution for violence is dialogue, is understanding, is an empathy with the others, like Gandhi always said. So we have to work on this. So this uh, non-violent toys campaign uh, directed us to peace education and culture of peace education uh, programs with local authorities and with the uh, Ministry of Education authorities. So it was like a fall 
you know, like a Yagara Falls or it was Sioux Falls in Latin America. So it comes to be bigger and bigger from the, it is very, very interesting indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, as an educator, I think you've spent a lot of your time and energy on transformative education, which you have seen as a way of overcoming or transforming cultures of domination. Because uh, the domination cultures are always violent. So can you explain how this works and what are some of the challenges that you're facing in this work? Uh, because today we live in a world where many people feel that there's a return of dominant cultures or dominating cultures. Across the world, you know, we are seeing in many societies this problem of hatred uh, coming up and uh, random violence in the name of uh, some kind of dominant culture or rather dominating culture. So can you uh, throw some light on what is the challenge that you are facing in transformative education as an answer to uh, the violence of dominant dominating cultures? Yeah, uh, showing in uh, the knowledge of history and how some empires and countries dominate others, we try to make this uh, translated in the educational field. And so we find uh, very many years ago, when we started trying to show in this, more than 20 years now, that uh, also this dominating culture is reproduced in schools. So there are dominant education systems that supported dominant cultures. And so we, and they are reproducing. So we started talking about reproducing education that reproduces dominant culture. And if there are dominant cultures, there are cultures that they are dominated. So <laughs> we have, some kind of cultures that are up, up, and it is supposed that they are the best. And then there are cultures that they are down, down, and it is supposed they are not significant or they are not important, particularly those coming from the natives of many countries that are dominated. And so uh, we think that we have to move from that paradigm, uh, dominated, culture and dominated education systems to systems that allow us more freedom, <coughs> uh, freedom in thinking, freedom in acting, and of course, transforming. So we were very much uh, illuminated by uh, new education theories coming from Europeans like Maria Montessori, the Italian, coming also from the Gandhian uh, tradition, because Gandhi was very much, um, how can I say, uh, wondered very much about what education can do in the liberation of countries and peoples. And also we were influenced by Durkheim, the North American uh, uh, thinker and educator, and mainly, I have to tell you, by Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire is a very important Brazilian uh, pedagogue that it is well known in all the world because I found it translated even in Japanese and in Arabic when I teach, that talks about uh, the need of liberation in order to be educated. So taking these uh, issues and also I have to name because it was, she, she was and she is my master, Betty Reardon from Columbia University in the United States. And it is really the founder of peace education as a field, as a science. So taking also all the work of Betty Reardon, we started 
uh, thinking about what we can do in this issue. And so we start to talk about how peace education and culture of peace education, where non-violence is a must, have, uh, have to allow people to think in another ways, to think uh, critically, to, to analyze the reality, to choose the education themes from the observation of the reality and from the peoples that are around us. And also to move about new, new learnings, I mean themes that are new learnings, and also methodology that allowed us to think critically. So we make a kind of twist of the education system, the traditional one, in the sense that knowledge is coming from the teacher and the professor and uh, the, the brains of the students are like a tabula rasa. You know what is tabula rasa in Latin? And uh, to respect the knowledge of the people before acting with the professors and that not knowledge that comes with the people that comes from the family from the community from their own traditions are important are valued and have to be part of the curricular design so we started respecting the people uh, principle in non-violence about what they know what they feel what they think and that are as valuable and then as the knowledge of the teacher. So we put in the peace education um, field in the same level, the knowledge of the professor and the teacher, let's say the educator, uh, with the level of the students and the pupils. And so we create new knowledges together. So this epistemology of uh, the knowledge also have to be joined with uh, another kind of methodologies that supported this, because the traditional methodology is just making lectures, talking, and you have to talk, and the pupils and students have to listen, and that's it. And so we know that lectures are very important, particularly from people that knows a lot, but also we know that dialogue is basic in order to make exchanges in between the knowledges, the pupils' knowledges and the teachers' knowledges, and the community knowledges and the educator knowledges. So this feedback that creates the dialogue, uh, um, I would say the brotherhood dialogue, a friendly dialogue creates really a very good base for um, making the knowledge, um, how can I say, richer for both. Because then we also realize that in this exchange, in this kind of peace education methodology, all the actors were enriched. So it is not all, only that the students of the community or the peoples learned, but at the same time, the educators learn a lot. Also, it is very respectful and it is Gandhian influence as well in the, in the way that we talk we try to talk not conceptual difficult meanings, but meanings that can be understood easily by people, not only by children, by the adults also, by the families. We also create a kind of, we enlarge the actors of the learning process. So in peace education and culture of peace education, we also see as educators towards the people in the streets, the grandmothers, the, the parents, the community leaders, the political leaders are also educators. So we have to learn from all 
and to create knowledge from all, because all knows something, even a little thing, and probably something that we don't know. So this kind of democratic issue is a basic is a basic issue in peace education. I mean, if you start making a kind of uh, authoritarian relationship, that is not our issue. So our issue is another one. So democracy, uh, understanding, freedom. New methodology, new themes are our basis in constructing a transformative education. That's it. Uh, I noticed in your writings that uh, Rian Eisler's book, famous book, Chalice and the Blade, is one of your influences, something that influenced you. Did that book also help you in this journey of transformative education? I mean, is there a dimension of that famous book that tells us something about nonviolence? Repeat the question because it is frozen. Oh, sorry, sorry. No. Uh, yeah. The Rian Eisler's book, Chalice and the Blade. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. it's one of the books that has yeah. influenced you. Do yeah. we learn something from that book about nonviolence? Yeah, um, uh, I approach to that reading being a pro uh, nations university in Costa Rica because uh, I, I was teacher teaching there peace education to future peace educators. That was in the, in the start of the 2000, I think, yeah. And so Eliane Riesler, I, I have a approach because she was also in Costa Rica and it was some schools that followed uh, that way of teaching and, uh, and book. And so I approached her uh, and, uh, and used the book as teacher's training that was. So how you can practice uh, new ideas, how you can practice, particularly all the related to emotional understanding of the knowledge and the relationship between emotions, feelings, and learning, which is so important. You know that today we know, and that is a new field that it, it is, it is named emotional intelligence, but on the 80s and 90s, it is not, how can I say, name like that, but Ellen Ressler knows about that a lot. And it was, I was very much engaged on that idea that when you learn and when you teach, it is not only your rational uh, put on the table. It is also your feelings, your emotional approach to the theme. And if you do that, I mean, if your uh, brains and your heart are in that process, that process goes better. <laughs> I mean, you really learn and you learn for the rest of your life. And it is true, you know, that that things that you have learned or read or experience, uh, not only from a rational mental point of view, but uh, uh, thinking, also thinking with your heart, which was Elian said, then makes more impact in your life and in what you are going to do. So that kind of uh, kit that you have, uh, rational and feelings, are very much, uh, very, very good explained in the book. And I understood very early that that was the path also for peace education. So yeah, it was very important in my own formation and, and what I teach in training teachers, uh, young teachers, that's, that's true. Great. Now over the last 30, 40 years, I think Latin America has seen many different experiments in nonviolent protest, uh, in nonviolent opposition to dictatorships and also 
in fighting various kinds of insurgency, which I called, uh, for example, the Columbia. Colombians faced a civil war for almost 50 years. And so many people out of uh, a kind of violence fatigue uh, have sought nonviolence. Can you give us a kind of overview? What today would you say are some of the key learnings from the many experiments with nonviolence uh, as a political method in Latin America? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Well, it, this is a long story that I have to tell you, and I am going to try to summarize because it is one, uh, one discipline in the university that I have. I mean, that it is uh, uh, Latin American social movements and the creation of culture of peace. That was the title of the discipline, uh, Simashin. Well, uh, you know, first, I try to summarize. First, uh, oh, the whole continent was dominated by empires. When I say the whole continent, the Latin American continent, of course, we can refer to United States and Canada as well because they were dominated by France and the United Kingdom. But in this, in my analysis, in this case, I am uh, analyzing from Mexico, thinking the continent that it is so big, that it is extraordinarily big, no? From Mexico to Argentina, the last country in the South, we were dominated by empires, by two empires, mainly the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire in Brazil. That is why the Brazilians talk Portuguese. Huh? That it is a cousin language. We understand between us. Huh? We understand. Then you have a small spots in Central America, uh, in English and French and Netherlands, uh, dominated, but they are very small spots. So we born in the modernity or in the actual, in the Western history, we were born dominated. That's, that's an issue that it is important. Eh? When we start being main, named in the books in Europe and in another continents like Asia and Africa, we were named as countries that were dominated by an empire. So we born for the Western history as um, people that were conquered by others. And so as we were conquered by others from 1495, when uh, Cristobal Colón arrived to our continent, at the same time started the rebellions. So we have a long story, 500 years and more of fighting or struggling, let's say, in violent and not violent ways uh, against domination. So this tradition is very important in Latin America and illuminates the present. Even more, when we have an actual, an actual fight, hmm, you always mention the issue that we were always dominated. So this kind of I would say permanent rebellion in between two groups, those who are dominating and those who are dominated in, I repeat, in violent or non-violent ways, this relationship is present in our, strongly present in our history. So from the very start, dear colleague, we have ways of uh, reaction. And that ways of reaction were sometimes violent, particularly in all the fights against the Spanish and Brazilian empire, and then there's fights inside the continent between different groups that try to be government, and also in the non-violent tradition, because we learn a lot. So nowadays, uh, Latin America is a continent known in the whole world as a continent that reacts to domination. I mean, in, and in, the, in the last, would say, 100 years, we have a lot of revolutions, not against a foreigner dominator, but against 
the own dominators because the issue of violence uh, had been introduced inside the countries in between different groups. So we have uh, the owners of the earth, the owners of the, uh, of the money, and those who have not, eh, who have not enough field, enough earth, enough work or whatever. And so we have these waves of social movements that characterize the country and that they rebel against the domination now, not of foreign forces, but from native forces, which in a way is worst from my point of view. Uh, so uh, we practice a lot of um, learning procedures and process that we have learned during the years. One uh, that I see today, and I am in this very moment uh, making a research of uh, social movements and what they ask uh, to the authorities and also what methodology they used. And it is very interesting from a peace educator, a nonviolent educator as me, to, to try to isolate those practices that, are, uh, that have impact, that are successful and they are not violent. That is my actual research, by the way. Hmm? So very interesting that you ask me. So I started from the old practices, from these 500 of rebellions, trying, of course, to search to the non-violent eh? because war is another issue. And I am searching now, we are searching, we are a group of Latin American experts that were searching on this. So what are good in order to practice a kind of arguments to the dominant uh, classes or groups or governments that are not violent? And so the first that we learned is uh, citizenship education. So we need that the people have to know their rights. So many times the people don't know their rights, so they don't struggle for their rights. And they are written in the constitution, by the way. So it's nothing that it is against the government because if the government are constitutional, if they are republics, if they are democracies, if they are, by the way, if they are, because the government always say that they are democracies, but we have some doubts. But anyway, if they are democracies, if they are republics, they are based in constitutions. And in the constitutions, like in the Indian one, you have your rights and you have your obligations as well. So we have to, to, to learn, we have to teach about that. So we introduced citizenship education in peace education. See, because we need that the people, the citizenship, the citizens know about their rights, about their obligations to the government, about uh, what um, authorities, to what authorities they have to go, to, to what or, um, state institutions they have to apply their requirements, their needs, their urgent uh, needs, of course, really related to education, to health, particularly after the CV-19, of course, the coronavirus, and what. So they have to know that they have to, that, that right. So first answer to you, citizenship education is one of the main tools that we use. So we started to work on citizen education and citizenship education methodology in uh, some countries in Latin America, like Chile, Argentina, Colombia, awful Colombia, because they are in war. So Colombia is uh, the Gaza Strip in, in Latin America, and Colombia is always war, so real war. Um, in Mexico, that it is a very, very violent country as well, in Brazil, so we are starting in these countries working, the, the peace educators and the non-violent educators in trying to, to search for these tools. We also find, of course, 
that uh, intercultural dialogue, intergenerational dialogue. It is, you understand, intergenerational. So the dialogue in between the old and the youth is important because the old knows how to do many things. The youth goes to violence. So let's let's hear to the people and the generation that makes the way in, in different ways. The, the youth are very much influenced with the violent mass media and the violence as a solution and the war as a solution of all. So let's hear to other people that have another ideas and even your family, your grandfathers who use this intergenerational education in Colombia, for example, with the old in Colombia, the people listen to this of 70 years old, 70, seven zero, have lived all their lives in war, all their lives in war. And so they have much to say against it and against the violence to their to their sons and daughters and to their grandsons. So this dialogue, intergenerational dialogue in between people that have suffered war and discrimination and, and poverty all their lives had to say how what we can do. And so uh, citizenship education as a learning in order to, to practice today in peace education intercultural dialogue between people from different cultures. We have in our country, but also in India, very many different groups with different cultural traditions and even different, in your case, different religions. We have also different religions because the natives have another from the Catholic religion that it is the main religion of the white people, but not of the other peoples. And so inter Religious dialogue is one of the points that I am very interested, which means intercultural dialogue. And all from that dialogue comes peace paths also. Also, we train teachers. So teachers training is very important because in the formal education, the teacher's training is a key. I mean, if you have not the teacher trained in nonviolence and in democracy, education so the teacher can do anything in, in in the in the classes we know that and also professors training so i am i am the conveyor of a very important network of uh, peace universities in in colombia for example that we work in professors training at uh, university level and even at post post university levels, as it to say, doctoral, etc. Very interesting and very important, I think. And we are introducing all these learnings also in Mexico. And, and now I, I was called by the UNESCO also to work on this and to work on the recommendation of human rights education, that it is a recommendation coming in 1974, that it is a very important recommendation of UNESCO on human rights and citizenship education as uh, in order to train teachers in the whole world. So it is going to be a, a global document as well. So it's important. I am very proud to tell you that uh, uh, the Latin American thinking in, in peace education today and in peace education method methodology is very is, is well known I mean so it is very usual that uh, we were asked to add or to join uh, other teams in other parts of the world I work in South Korea for example where I found by the way Paulo Freire book translated into Korean I work in, in North Africa with the Arabs groups uh, and I found our books I mean from our region translated. So this is not a kind of Latin American marketing, really, <laughs> if it sounds like that. No, but no, really, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. It, it was not. But I mean, I, after so many years in the field, because think that I start really when I was 18, and I am now in the 70s. So 
I found that it was a very important, how can I say, a knowledge of, of what we were doing, particularly in the last 20 years that of course we have not at all before. So we, we, we read Gandhi because we, that it is really, that is true what the dictator she said, it is very far. And when they say it is very far, doesn't matter. I thought it is not far in the thinking. It is far geography. India is very far from us, but for the thinking, not. No, but no, no. It's I didn't clear. tell that to the government, so we yeah. can. I didn't tell that to the government, so we can continue read it without problems. Uh, so this is very important, and I think it is important to uh, to highlight as well. So and how. So uh, listen, this kind of thinking that comes from different regions very far, really, it's only one thinking. That's it. Yeah. So in closing, Alicia, I'm delighted to see that you are so hopeful. Would you like to say something in closing about what is the inner strength that gives you so much hope and confidence for this work? Yeah, and it's a very important uh, question. Thank you very much. Because, uh, you know, sometimes youth and students in my life ask me that. So what makes you follow up and continue the path that you have decided, you and other colleagues, of course, uh, so many years ago? Uh, first of all, the knowledge that the problems continue existing. I mean... The, 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 the problems and the problematics, the world of problematics uh, and the violence that uh, David Adams had called culture of violence, no? a culture of war, um, was fixed in the world, continue existing. So the, the, the reason for what we started, started working are there, are here, were there, and are here. So we have the same, how can I say, obstacles, we have the same uh, problems or, or worst. Uh, war uh, is also uh, a permanent so-called solution to problems in between nations. War is a so-called solution in international relationship and violence is a so-called solution between peoples. And so the violence, the domestic violence, the violence against women, the violence against children and youth, the violence against different ideas, political or religious ideas are here. So that makes us continue thinking that we need a transformation that we need a transformative education, that we need to change the structural violence in a friendly relationship. And so culture of peace education continues to be a need. And so if it is a need, here we are. Thank you so much. So inspiring. Okay, so I am very very thankful to, to your invitation to be part of this series. And of course, I offer what you need from the uh, peace education field at the international level, as I am an international level or Latin American level, to talk to you and to work with you whenever you need. Because thank we you. are one. Yes, we are yes, in the thank you. Team. That would be an honor. Yes. Okay. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much.